All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And thanks for taking some time today to spend it with us at Mantis Innovation. Uh, we are looking forward to spending some time talking with you today about what is going on in the energy markets, really talking a little bit more about hybrid and managed type of products and approaches, and then really finding a way to help everybody integrate green energy into their um, client solutions. So with that, I'll introduce myself. I am Craig Wall. I am the Vice President of Supply and Markets here at Mantis Innovation. And as a co-presenter today, we have John Vieira, who is our Director of Strategic Market Intelligence. And what we will be covering today is giving them a general idea on who Mantis Innovation is. Just want to make sure that everybody is familiar with our solutions and the scope of the services that we can offer throughout our organization. We're going to talk a little bit about the managed solution, primarily around fixed and index, and then hybrid solutions. We're going to turn it over to my good friend, John, who will then talk a little bit about some natural gas fundamentals, some market news, talk about how weather is impacting the market, and then go through some additional market data. After we get through some of that, we're going to go through sustainability. We're going to talk about RECs, purchasing different types of renewable energy credits, and then how to incorporate this for your clients. Um, that is really what we're going to be covering today. So let's just go ahead and give a quick recap on who Mantis Innovation is. Mantis Innovation is a full service um, facility asset management company, which provides sustainable solutions that are designed to help improve building performance, manage budgets, and then to find ways to have turnkey program management to reduce consumption, to produce power yourself, and then to purchase power better. The goal with this is to really help um, reduce the overall cost of a facility's energy spend while also reducing their consumption and then also reducing their carbon uh, emissions. So how do we do that? We do that with green energy procurement. We do that through standard energy procurement. We offer demand response, solar, roofing, building envelope, pavement. Some of the retrofitting solutions that we offer are LED lighting, HVAC and mechanical, um, integrating building automation systems, doing data center optimization, and then other types of sustainability such as onsite generation. Um, other types of onsite generation are also included, not just solar. And then we're also able to assist with EV chargers across the country. So what we wanted to do today was just kind of start off a little bit different. We're going to talk about some products. And the reason we want to talk about the product first is so that when we go through the data, we go through the market information, you can think a little bit about how these products will be able to impact um, or would be impacted by the market information that you're going to be seeing today. So let's start off by looking at the standard products which you might be used to. We have the traditional um, fixed price solution, which is what I'd say a majority of the people that are on this call are familiar with, where you have a fixed price, which is you're going to be setting a point in time, you're going to be executing a contract, and then you're going to be getting bids in. Uh, whether that's through the reverse auction platform or the standard procurement methodology that we have. And you're going to be getting a contract for a term at a fixed price. So nice things about this solution is that you're going to have the cost stability. You're going to have a, specific, a pretty close idea on what your budget certainty is going to look like. This is also a simple solution. So it's going to be along the lines of set it and forget it. It's going to be a price for KWH. And it's going to be something where you're able to really just kind of know what the price that you're going to be paying is. Um, then we have a index solution. The index solution is the exact opposite of a fixed price solution. So with this one, you're going to be um, floating on an index. The index is going to be based on um, the clearing prices of the region that you're in. So if you're in PJM, it's going to be based on clearing prices in PJM. These rates change every five minutes, um, and you're going to be able to see that reflected in um, the cost that you pay. 
So it's going to be based on your load profile, what you spend, um, what you use, when you consume it. And the nice thing about this is that there's very low risk premiums associated with this because you're not going to be hedging something. Um, so we don't have to go out into the future and buy it um, or hedge for it. It's going to present some solutions for flexibility. So if you want to go from a variable index solution to going to a fixed, that's something that can be done. If you want to go from an index solution to a managed program or a hybrid, that is also something that can be done. Um, also, this is a fantastic solution for organizations that run three shifts or have a significant amount of off-peak usage. So if, if it's a three-shift manufacturer and you run an overnight shift, power during the night, depending on the season and where you're located, is typically going to be less expensive than purchasing it during the day. So that is something else to keep in mind for how it works for your specific clients. Then we have the hybrid solution. The hybrid solution is going to be essentially what I like to think of as the best of both worlds, right? So with this, you're going to be able to um, have a specific amount of your power at a fixed price per KWH. So if you want to have 50% of your power fixed and you want to float 50%, that's definitely something that can be achieved through this. So this is a great solution for organizations and companies and clients that don't know whether the market's going to be going up, whether the market's going to be going down. It's going to allow for more targeted approaches to trying to get clients to budget objectives. And it really deals with the volatility in the market at any given time. So if the prices look to be going up and you want to lock in 25% of that, we can achieve that. If the markets come down and you want to go long and lock in the remaining 75%, that's something else that could be done. Um, you get the benefits of both worlds, right? So you have some cost stability. You're going to have some budget certainty because you're going to know at least whatever percentage of the hedge that you do is going to be that fixed price for you. It's actually really simple. So it's going to be more along the lines of do we want to do 50%, 75%, 25% as a fixed, and then the remainder as a float. And then we can also get a little bit more customized depending on the client's needs. Um, just some key points on this is that you can fix in a percentage of your electricity and then the rest of it's going to be settled on the index. So depending on what you're really trying to do um, for clients who are looking to really reduce their price risk while also maintain the flexibility of being able to make decisions down the road, this is something that could really help with that. Um, other benefits that you're going to be looking at is that if the markets are going up, we set up triggers, we set up alerts so that if the market hits a specific point, we can execute some additional hedges, um, whether that's if the market's going down or if the market is starting to spike so that we can help reduce the exposure to those spikes. Um, this is one of those solutions where you build a plan and then you work to the plan. So if there are reasons why a client might want to stagger throughout the year, um, different percentages, or if they have a winter usage that's extremely high, there are different structures and strategies that we can employ in order to really make sure that the clients get the most bang for their buck out of this type of strategy. So I'm going to turn it over to John to talk a little bit about natural gas, what's going on in the market, and then when you're listening to this, just think about how this can impact either a fixed price product or an index, and then start thinking about what would it mean if instead of just doing fixed or index, we did something in the middle. John? Thanks, Craig. Good afternoon, everyone. So starting off with natural gas fundamentals, because again, it's here for us every week, and really it can become a slow story. I mean, in the summer, forgetting that fall and winter is right around the corner, um, but really makes such a big story from anywhere from ice in New England down through PJM. Um, estimates for this week were lower, I mean, kind of moving on the lower side. We kind of been hitting the triple digits, 90s. This was 81 at 83, and we actually came out, came out at the 70s. So we came in below the final estimates. So a little bit bullish there, uh, at least in the short term, because that was a sizable miss. Because, yeah, each BC, every billion cubic feet is a big amount that you're missing by. Uh, really, the important number is where we compare to that five-year average. So 
Ooh, down from the 360s to 350. So still at a good amount of surplus compared to that five-year average right now. Um, but these numbers change quickly and we could go from a surplus to a deficit, just like how we did the exact opposite last year. We were running at a deficit most of the year. As we can see, if we look here in the middle of the chart where the blue line was hanging below, and that's when prices took off last year. Then we had the super warm winter and we started actually having more gas by the time we got through february as a result of that warm winter here in the us and around the world i mean top two or three back to 1950 1960s of the warmth since that time we've kind of had prices kind of hanging around the bottoms kind of moving left to right maybe giving up a few mils a few cents but what we're worried about is how much lower they can go a little bit versus them going right back to the highs we saw before if some of these stories materialize that we've been covering so that's the story that we want to keep a close eye on as we progress through summer into the fall. If we start to see the blue line getting close to the gray, expect prices to go up. If we see the blue line get to or below the gray, expect prices to spike and re rally really high, almost back to the levels where we were before. So one of the things we want to take a look at for natural gas is how much are we producing and keeping here for our, our citizens to use and how much are we shipping out the door? Because really it's the net number that matters to us. So on this forecast, if we look to the right for the gray, indicated by, I mean, the red line between what actually has happened in the forecast, we see that the orange gold line is moving up a little bit, not really. Um, so maybe getting a little bit on production there, so maybe one or two BCF. But at the same time, we're hitting records for natural gas exports that we're sending out the door, about 14 BCF and change right now. Uh, some people have forecast by 2028 to 2030 that will be doubling the export capacity out of this country. So if we end up sending, I mean, double out the door, so we're sending 28 BCF a day, so we're increasing by 14 to call it 20 BCF extra going out the door, but we only increase production by three, we're at a net loss of 17. So that's a, one of the big issues that we need to keep following of how quickly are these LNG product, projects being on, uh, coming online and what's that doing for a net effect for our supply because less supply, puts upward pressure on prices. Where is it being shipped? We've taken a look at this plenty of times before, but National Balancing Point in the UK, Tidal Transfer Facility, the Dutch Virtual Aid Trading Hub that's used for the EU, and over to Asia, which is usually referenced by the JKM, the Japan Korean marker. So just taking a look at a publicly available tool. So we sometimes use a different chart for this, but this is, again, this is Henry Hub spot price. So this is not the price of the Henry Hub for the future terms that we're covering, and it's not the regional price that we cover uh, for the different zones that we sell in. However, it is a good way for a picture telling a thousand words to say, you know, I mean, what's the chance of prices going up and down? And that gets into confidence intervals and statistics, which is a little bit too much into the weeds for most clients, but just understanding is the chance it goes up bigger than the chance it goes down? And you can clearly see the black arrows are much bigger than the red arrows with prices going up versus down. And that's kind of where, you know, I mean, it bottoms out. You see, yeah, prices could go down a little bit, not too much. They could spike back higher than they have been in the past, indicated by the black lines. And using this thinking to apply to the different charts that we're going to cover in the market data section. Taking a look at market news. Um, Starting off a little New York heavy, just getting back from New York Tape, covering a bunch of the stories out there. And really the big theme in New York right now is over the next several years, some of the rules that were made in 2019 are starting to come into actual reality. So one of those is the peaker rule, and it's about peaker plants. And those basically are the safety valves of the energy system. They come on line in times of high demand to make sure that we can run during times for reliability and resiliency. Okay, since this peak of rules come out, we've had 37 closures of generation units so far. So that's a big amount of supply to lose. So again, lose supply, upward pressure on prices, especially now as we talk about demand that's gonna be going through the roof on the next slide. So in the wording that's on the New York website, I mean, a lot of the uh, wording is very much, okay, we're gonna try to keep this rule in place. We might not be able to, because you know, I mean, this might cause devastating effects to the grid. So that was the original story. Now, the electrical grid operators are nice of coming out with a warning saying, hey, you know what? We're already seeing more of a negative effect from this rule than it was expected. By 2025, we could be in a real world of hurt. So 
it's important to take a look at so especially those outside years strategize now because again if we keep losing supply it's going to put that upward pressure on prices and on top of that we have different laws we have local law 97 which was known and that's in new york city so that's zone j and all the surrounding areas there about having to you know i mean get fossil fuels out of buildings on different sizes so if you get rid of fossil fuel and you electrify, that's the big buzzword in New York right now is electrification. Let's electrify everything. So what does that mean? That means they're going to need more electricity because the demand is going to be much higher. So we start doing buildings, no more natural gas, and they need to run on electricity. And we're shutting off natural gas plants. Where is this electricity going to come from? Uh, some numbers were thrown out. I mean, peaks in New York really get up to usually around the 30,000 megawatts. We're talking about having to double the capacity on the grid to about 60,000 megawatts. Now, that would mean in the next seven to 10 years, bringing on almost double what was brought on for generation in the past 20 years. And this generation is not going to be dispatchable and reliable. It's going to be intermittent resources like solar and wind. And we're going to get to some problems with the supply chains for solar and wind in a second. In addition to that, Governor Holchill of New York just came out uh, with the new budget for the state basically outlawing natural gas and fossil fuels across the state in most all new buildings so this is the first in our nation rule basically outlawing natural gas in new builds so that's going to drive up even further demand for electricity in new york while at the same time we're shutting down supply so it's really a recipe for prices to get much higher so we have seen things rules pass like this in california and california has suffered the effects of having to have rolling blackouts um also california in the past uh recent past passed the rule to say you know what new tailpipe emissions which are going to make more gas cars basically unable to be built in the state so if we go to evs they're going to need more electricity funny thing is they passed the rule and then about a week later they had to put out a call for consumers not to charge their cars because of peak uh peak days were coming through now this all goes into the biggest story the climate leadership and community protection act clcpa in new york which is a very expansive plan to make this move to 2040 to net zero generation so these are huge changes that are coming down the pike and very lofty goals and right now we are not on pace to hit that and the more changes we make the more uncertainty and that's why it's really important to keep customers informed especially as these rules come through that could push prices much higher And for a touch of reality from uh, this past Sunday afternoon, if we take a look at the wheel on the left, we notice that dual fuel, which is natural gas and oil fired plants, natural gas and then nuclear pretty much make up the majority of the generation in NISO. Like in most of our different markets, natural gas is usually one of the leaders and that's the dual fuel and natural gas here. Nuclear usually part of base. We have a bigger chunk of coal and ERCOT and PJM. Now, if we look at the renewables in New York, we have hydro, which has been existing in there the whole time, and then other renewables, that tiny little slice in the corner. So that's the piece that's supposed to overtake all the red and orange. So is that going to be possible to do in the next five years, in the next 10 years? That's a pretty tall kill that we have to climb. So just a touch of reality into, I mean, what people want to do and where we're at, at actually at currently. And if we look year over year for Q3 and Q4 and take a look at New York, right, they're actually down um, in the renewable year, uh, renewables for generation year over year. So not heading in that right direction. And if we take a look at forecast around the country for solar and wind for the black and green line, we're not seeing those lines shoot up straight to the top for that generation. We're seeing them move up a little bit as they go through into 2024. So again, Lofty goals from politicians and the reality of actually building projects seem to be very apart, far apart right now, which is going to cause a lot of uncertainty and volatility in the next coming years. Again, shutting down supply, that can be done immediately. Bringing on new generation, that can take a while if it does end up coming. And if we go back to 2010, we've only had a really 2% increase a year in these renewables. So unless something drastically changes or some new technology falls out of the sky, it's going to be very hard to meet these goals. Take a look at some of the U.S. energy stories. So a lot of noise uh, news has been around the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, 
which the name really not fitting for what's in the bill. Um, it's really energy and social care um, that's being paid for that in the hopes of 10 years down the road, it's going to save people money. Um, but really, really what we're focused on is the energy piece. So depending on what reports you see out there, it's somewhere between 360 and 389 billion on the White House website. They have $369 billion is going to be put towards this clean and green transition underneath the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's a huge amount of money. The big story that we've touched upon a little bit is the U U.S. Department of Labor, under President Biden's instruction, made a rule that for private citizens' retirement accounts, so our retirement accounts, need to be influenced by climate change consideration and ESG consideration. So this is going to touch around $12 trillion. So that $369 billion pales in comparison to $12 trillion additional dollars. It just shows how large a change this is, how costly it's going to be, and what needs to uh, be thrown at it to try to make it happen. So actually, bipartisan legislation was passed to overturn the rule, and President Biden came out with his first veto of his presidency to overturn it and keep his rule in place. We also have 25 states suing to overturn this rule because basically instructs investment managers to ignore their fiduciary obligations to get people the most money back on their investments and put them at risk of losing money on ESG or climate change projects. So it shows really the government whole approach, how far they're willing to go to hit these goals and a lot of the uncertainty around it because of how much needs to be spent on it. So again, it's not whether you love it or hate it. It's simply it's what's happening and we need to keep an eye on it. EPA, we've been covering since it started 2023. They had a hard loss at the Supreme Court in 2022 for overreach of power, but that has not slowed them down at all. They've circled their wagons and they've come out with a whole litany of rules over the past few months, uh, trying to do death by a thousand cuts to fossil fuel plants. Talk about mercury emissions, stomach strongest limits ever against weight, weight water, smog that travels over state lines from coal plants. Talking about that could also shut down, you mean 13% of the country's coal capacity, if not more. So again, losing supply. On the other side, they're making rules that are gonna basically make it harder and harder for natural gas, um, for regular gas cars to continue. Forcing a switch to EVs. If we switch to EVs, that's gonna drive up demand. So these rules are all coming out that are shutting down supply and the other set of rules are driving up demand. It's going to leave us in a very precarious situation to be able to actually supply this electricity. So again, another reason to take a look at those outside years, especially at the low levels we're at now. Other story that people were talking about recently was the Fed just paused on the long interest rate hike campaign that basically they've been continuing since we come out of that pandemic hiking every meeting they've had. The consensus does say they're going to hike at least two more times this year. These high interest rates, along with supply chain issues, have already caused many problems, especially for offshore wind projects from coming online. In Massachusetts, both of the offshore wind projects, basically the people that were participating wanted to get out of deals. Now, this was after they were already getting tons and tons of free money through subsidies to make them economic because they're not economic without subsidies. And now they're saying, even with all this free money, we can no longer you know, I mean, be profitable because of the high interest rates and the economics around the deal. So. That's a risk, again, shutting down supply and then maybe not being able to bring on all these offshore wind things. And that's uh, not even mentioning, you I mean, a lot of mayors around um, PJM, NISO, and even ISO New England now taking a look at uh, animals showing up on beaches such as whales. And, you know, I mean, maybe it's going to be the left eating the left in the way of offshore wind is not good for the animals of the environment. So will that delay any wind projects any, even further? The Russia, Ukraine attack, uh, Russia versus the Ukraine still going on, the invasion and the attacks, awful humanitarian issue that we've talked about. The big problem has been highlighted by Europe. They had one plan, no backup plan, go green as fast as possible. And then obviously this problem started. Overnight, we saw prices take off because of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline not being completed that Biden the Buru that Trump had not allowed because they didn't want reliance on Russia for the EU. Then the Nord Stream 1 pipeline getting taken out. Then the worries about the biggest nuclear plant in Europe being taken over by Russia, which could set back, you know, I mean, the acceptance of nuclear here, which again would be a huge hit for supply because now we're talking about the three biggest forms of generation here that we currently use being under fire and 
are we going to be able to replace that all in time? Other big news that we need to keep a watch out for, nothing new here, but still one of the biggest stories hanging out is the U.S. Commerce Department starting an investigation in February of 2022 into imports, solar imports that were around 85% of what we were using to make projects here in the U.S. So they were saying that they were taking Chinese products, putting the stamp of their country to avoid tariffs and make the projects economic. If these projects have to pay the Chinese tariff, a lot of them would go underwater or possibly be pushed back or even canceled. To avoid this in June of 22, President Biden granted a two-year waiver. Since then, there's been bipartisan legislation to overturn this waiver, but President Biden, and this has become a normal course of action, having either himself make an executive order using one of his um, his groups to I mean, put a rule out like the ESG rule for 401ks, Congress overturning that through bipartisan legislation, him vetoing it and keeping the rule in place. Again, not whether you love it or hate it, simply what we expect as we move forward, as long as Democrats control the White House. The bigger question is, what happens when the waiver expires in June of 2024? Are we going to be able to build solar here when we have to pay a minimum wage with health benefits in the U.S. versus over in those countries? Because the preliminary investigation showed in December of 2022 that, yes, these countries were guilty of skirting the China tariff, and the actual results were supposed to already be out, but they've been pushed back to August. Lastly, that Chinese relationship has become very important to this change to go clean. So that has its other questions of, you know, I mean, it make using a coal plant to make a renewable turbine and you know, I mean, what's the net effect and will an EV car actually make it the 20 to 30 years it needs to run on the road before it gets in an accident and then the entire engine needs to be replaced. So a lot of variables there. But the bigger question is right now, China is handling our renewable minerals, our refining, our manufacturing of renewable parts. So if overnight this relationship continues to sour and the two main sticking points of the South China see in Taiwan, whether it's independent, I mean, or it's part of China. And we haven't been able to get past that. The past few diplomatic meetings have not gone that well. And just for an example, uh, the Secretary of the Interior, Deb Holland, I mean, confirmed uh, roughly like 63% of rare earth mining occurs in China. And we're not being able to have that here. So if we depend on them to do this whole clean, pro clean transition, we could put ourselves in a really tough position. Because right now we have the fuel here to run natural gas plants. We have the coal here if we wanted to run coal plants. But if we have to rely on other countries for this supply, that puts, you know what I mean, being able to handle it internally on other countries. Taking a quick look at weather, this was June, July, and August for ERCOT, kind of came true for June, started getting hot. Uh, for ice in New England down through PGM, haven't seen exactly the heat popping up as much just yet. But as we see, the chart only gets darker as we're looking at July, August, September, more than likely above average temperatures. So will that materialize? Depends on how many heat waves are caught. We saw prices spike during record peak last week into the thousands immediately, like we had talked about for a couple months, that as soon as that happens, you're going to see July, August move back up and they moved in kind. One of the things that happened is the picture on the right we'd been looking at for a while, that's a picture of La Nina. Picture on the left is an El Nino. So we've been in a La Nina for quite some time. We have now left neutral and moved into El Nino conditions. It could make it warmer, drier for now. But one of the things that two stories that are working together, what we covered at the beginning, the natural gas story, having enough compared to the five-year average currently, plus the chance that this winter, you know, I mean, might not be as cold because we'll be in an El Nino, have kind of helped keep a lid on prices. If this flips by late summer or, I mean, early fall, all of a sudden we could be in a world of hurt, especially if, you know, I mean, our surplus compared to the five-year average of natural gas storage drops, and then we move from an El Nino back to a La Nina, we could see prices really take off. And for the coming week, ice in the wing when getting warm, not expecting a peak day. PGM getting a little bit hotter into next week. Um, right now, get, keeping a close eye on Monday through Wednesday. Wednesday could end up getting hotter if the heat bubble kind of pushes up from the south and west into PGM. We might be talking about sending out a peak notification for those days. And in Texas, it's staying real hot. So keeping an eye on those LMPs. If they take off, make sure to let clients know. 
that, you know, I mean, those might drive up the rest of this summer prices plus next summer's. So holding on to maybe save a mill or two to lose five to 10 mils over a longer period of time doesn't really make sense. And again, just as another way to look at what Craig had covered earlier is really, if you buy a fixed price strategy, you want to do that if you only think prices are going up. You buy an index strategy if you think prices after today are only going down. If you're not really sure, that's where the hybrid strategy really comes into play, get you to maximize, take a look at all the risk factors and customize something that fits your needs. And if you're a small to medium client, fixing in that ad or now, kind of waiting on, and then as us as consultants, being able to reach out to them if things, these stories continue to materialize because they've started, um, that are going to push prices up to let them know, hey, you know, it's a good time to maybe take a look at locking in now and flipping in. So again, we are in capacity tag season right now for peak days. We'll be sending these out. Uh, we have not sent out any yet for PGM or ICE in New England because the load, the heat really hasn't shown up just yet. So make sure to sign up. It's free for our clients and also for pro, uh, prospects. Lastly, taking a look at the market data, just wanted to go through the point again that F through K, as we look down here, those prices all higher usually. ABC kind of trades by itself. It's Western New York. It's not heavily populated. Doesn't have the same electrification goals just yet. The statewide ban is going to put some strain on that as well. So taking a look at the two areas, NISO zone J, obviously, right? We're up in the Northeast, Mid-Atlantic, Tri-State area. Those prices for the winter are going to be the most expensive. So it's very important, especially if you're competing against a utility rate that does not include the winter. That's why that short term rates a lot lower because it doesn't have those higher months included. So these pictures can help explain away that difference. Now that we've left the winter where they had the winter rates coming down and you know, I mean, a 12 month look better naturally because it had all the months averaged together. So again, using this type of idea, how high or low can we go from here by looking at the charts in the past? So again, 52 week chart here, we see the top of the graph and we see we're hanging around the bottoms right now. So, the high point, I mean, would be our lid right now. And lower, if we look to the green chart for the long term and we go to really where the start of the Russia Ukraine war doesn't get too much lower, hanging around the bottoms, great part, great time to at least lock in part of that load. Similar story for calendar year 24. On the other hand, these prices for zone A are about half of what you're looking at for zone J. Doesn't have the same concentration of population, doesn't have the same demand for electricity. And there's more power plants in the area because it's a lot harder to build a power plant in New York City than it is to put do it out in Western New York. So not as volatile, not as higher prices in Zone A. Um, so just using the right areas when you're covering. Take a look at that map. Similar pattern um, for the balance of the year. Again, coming off those high spikes that went through last summer into the fall. Prices came crashing down in the warm winter. We've been hanging around the lows. Calendar year 24 did pop above that 52 week average. It is a touch below right now as of this morning. Um, but again, good place to pick it up. Taking a look at Transco zone six. So this is New York gas. Again, very similar picture. Looking at that 52 week to show you, I mean, where have we been this past year? Taking a look at the orange chart to kind of see that we're just kind of been moving along, around, along the bottom for right now. Kind of waiting to see in, in these bullish stories when they pop and when does the heat get here? Those are the two biggest things, governance and weather that are right around the corner. And similar story for county year 24 for gas for New York. And then just going through these charts a little bit quicker. They will be out there for you. But again, the winter months are most expensive in ice in New England. We're hanging around the bottoms for balance of the year for ice in New England and for calendar year 24. Similar story for gas in New England, balance of the year for Algonquin, right near the lows, calendar year 24, basically in the same spot. PGM, cheaper, um, I mean, than ice in New England, which is the most expensive in the country for the markets we're dealing with. But again, winter is the most expensive, balance of the year for PGM, hanging around the lows, calendar year 24, hanging around the lows. So how high can it go? You can go to the top line. How low can it go? It can come off a little bit more. Do you want to put all of that money at risk? Tech OM3, same story for PGM gas, hanging around the lows for both balance of the year and calendar year 24. On the opposite, we have ERCOT where it's returned to the normal shape where the summer is the most expensive compared to the winter. 
Still some premium in there from Storm Uri that happened a few years ago. If we see Jan and February of 24, kind of close to July of 24, but August obviously the most expensive month. And that's been moving back up since the heat has got to Texas. If we look at balance of the year for ERCOT Houston, hanging around the 52 week lows, but moving a little higher. And calendar year 24, moving up a little bit more. Houston Chip Channel. Hanging around those 52-week lows, although moving up a bit. And Houston Chip Channel, calendar year 24, kind of just moving left to right over the past couple of weeks. And as we look at the middle, right, this is Houston Chip Channel, which is neighbor with the Henry Hub in Erath, Louisiana. Pretty much the same shape, same price, but not the same for around the country. So if we look, Algonquin obviously has the biggest basis, and that would be the space between the blue and the gray line. The gray line is the Henry Hub. And the basis is the spacing between the two. If you took out the blue in microscope, you'd also see the changes look just that big for PJM and green for Transco Zone 6 for New York. Houston Chip Channel actually is a touch below the Henry Hub. As we took a look at the outside years, Zone J, this is an important graph because you're seeing the money move in there. Yes, across the board, they're all lower, but as the tide rises and if this shape kept the same thing and surpassed where the gray bar is, Gray bar is off the board because that's the last price of the full year of, Jan uh, of 2023, traded as of 12 28 2022. As of now, prices had sunk because of the warmer winter, but we're seeing a lot of fear going into 25 and 26 with all these new policy rules of shutting down the safety peaker plants and also the electrification, which is going to drive up demand to unseen levels in the state. NISO Zone A doesn't have exactly that same fear just yet because they haven't had to deal with the problem. Some of these new rules might see that going into those outside years. ICE in New England, 24 and 25, still more expensive, but the outside years continue to move up, take advantage sooner than later. PGM, who has all these EPA rules, we've seen those outside years continue to move up. We're trying to get people to look at the months ago when they were at much lower prices. So. Make sure that story's out there, letting them know if that supply's at risk and it disappears. It's going to be a really tough spot. Aircott, a uh, lot tighter range in the markets, everything pretty close to each other within a mill or so for those outside years. We're seeing them all move up and down together. And that would be the problem is if we have some of these hot prints come out during June of high prices during the heat, I mean, all these years might move up. And now you're looking at an increase on the next 36 months of a contract that come out. Lastly, just some points to consider, managing risk of how high or low the market can go from here, especially since most of our markets are hanging around the lows. Evaluating the longer terms, especially with all the governance and rules coming out right now, and everyone kind of being comfortable with the gas supply and, okay, El Nino might be around this winter, just a little bit above 50% chance. Not a big thing. Hope is not a plan. Most expensive months are in NISO, ice New England, PGM in the winter months. Most expensive in ERCOT of the summer, so very important contract term. And we're comparing it to other rates, especially shorter term utility rates, to make sure they understand the value of what a longer term contract is now. We've had those major drop off in prices since the start of the new year. Most of the markets are all below the 52 week average and close to the low, so very reasonable spot to lock in. Some are all that load. Government push to go green and clean continues unabated. Uh, we continue, We expect more of this. The big question is, are they going to be able to do it well and in time as they're shutting down supply? Um, so far, there's been a lot of problems. Will that continue or get better? If it's not replaced in a reliable and resilient manner, it's going to mean a lot higher prices. And last, just with some of these rules coming out and some people talking about the value that we offer is just being that informed consultant, being able to help inform clients of, you know, I mean, what strategies best meet their needs and their risk tolerance to really take advantage of something when it's there. All right, Craig, back to you. Great, John. Thanks. Fantastic information. And now we just want to talk a little bit about how we can potentially start integrating some green solutions for our clients. So with that, we're going to look at renewable energy credits. Um, just some basics, just want to lay a little bit of the fundamentals here. A renewable energy certificate, it's a tradable market instrument, and it it really represents one megawatt hour of electricity from a renewable source. So if you are looking at going green, and let's say that you use a thousand megawatt hours a year, 
Um, in order to offset that, you're going to have to purchase 1,000 renewable energy credits. So just to kind of give you a general idea on how those are purchased and priced, um, they're a tradable instrument and it gives the attributes of the energy generation from the asset, depending on the type of renewable energy credit you get, to the point of use. There are some common types of renewable energy credits. You've probably heard of Green E, which is the national, um, the international standard for kind of certifying um, renewable energy credit. Um, there are also some ways where, depending on what you're actually trying to say or what the client is trying to say, more importantly, um, what claims they're trying to make, we can narrow down the types of RECs that would help them achieve that. Um, there are some states that have specific rules for compliance. Um, everything that we do here and everything that we look at when we're talking about renewable energy credits is voluntary. So it's going to be about whether somebody is looking um, to really start becoming more sustainable and helping to invest in green energy. So a little bit more, uh, more information. So different states are setting their own goals um, and they're actually stating what you might have heard as like the renewable portfolio standard. Um, so there's gonna be a required minimum amount of green power required for different markets. Now, when people are looking to go more than the minimum, that's where we're gonna be looking at the voluntary market. It's gonna be for clients, customers, and organizations who are really looking to do more. Um, RECs are the, the actual vehicle that you can use to demonstrate that you are purchasing green power. Um, and that's going to be the simplest explanation for the voluntary market. When we look at certification and verification, we want to make sure that these RECs are being um, not double counted. We want to make sure that our clients are getting what they paid for, that they can only be claimed by one customer. And the way that this is done is that these are going to be verified by an independent third party. The independent third party that we typically see is going to be Green E. Um, and these national Green E RECs can be purchased either through a commodity contract or we can actually purchase them unbundled so they can be purchased without a commodity contract as well. Um, and again, the verification just ensures that it's traceable so that we can make sure that our clients could substantiate the claims that they are making. So just talking a little bit about the benefits. When you're talking to your clients, just trying to get an idea on what they're doing, whether they want to become more sustainable, they want to green, they're trying to do some public relations. Some of the benefits here are that they're going to be helping to reduce their carbon footprint. So for organizations that are really working to um, achieve ESG targets, um, to try to make sure that their employees know it, that their customers know it, um, then you're going to be really benefiting from purchasing RECs. Um, it's, it's really, yeah, it's really designed to help encourage more green power to come on. Um, and it really just makes it so that our clients can benefit from um, what they're really trying to say. Um, some of the costs, the costs for RECs are going to be some of the lowest cost. Uh, methods to go green, to go renewable. Um, and then inside of that, there are some really great PR benefits. Um, one of the most important questions I typically ask our clients before we start going down the path of Rex is what are they trying to say? What do they need their press release to say so that we can understand what they're really trying to do? Um, what are their goals? What ESG targets are they working towards? Is this coming from them? Is this coming from the employees? Is this something that's coming from the clients? Or is this something coming down from investors or their C-suite? So we just want to make sure that we have a really nice, open, fact-finding discussion with our clients to figure out why they're doing this um, so that we can make sure that they get the correct solution that satisfies their needs. Um, again, one of the other ways we can do this, we could do this inside of a commodity contract. So if somebody is looking to go green for the next three or four years, whatever it is for the term of their commodity contract, that's something that we can do. Um, 
there is the option though for people that are already in a commodity contract or for new clients that you're working on if they're already working with a competing broker or if they're working with um, a supplier being able to differentiate ourselves and to change the conversation from just price of power and price of gas to really focusing on the holistic solution for the clients and what they're really trying to achieve um, organization wide when it comes to um, their green targets, the renewable targets, their ESG goals. This is a way for us to have a nice conversation with them to figure out what we can do to help satisfy their needs. So some other options out there um, that are gonna be reserved for clients that are typically gonna be of a larger size, roughly the minimum size for any of these two options are going to be around 10,000 megawatt hours annually. Um, we are able to do power purchase agreements. So for people that wanna have um, the attributes from a specific asset, um, this is a way that we can help achieve that. Um, this is gonna be something where that they're gonna be generating the recs, they're gonna own the actual physical power that's getting delivered. These are gonna be more complex transactions for larger clients that are gonna have a pretty decent amount of capital to invest. Um, financial power purchasing agreements are also known as um, virtual power purchasing agreements. This is gonna be something where the power isn't actually gonna be delivered to the end use customer, it's going to be delivered to the grid um, however, by doing this, there are going to be some contracts which are going to allow them to manage and to make all the claims of the actual asset. So you're going to start hearing words from your clients when it's words like locationality and additionality. Um, when those start coming up, we're going to want to change the conversation um, from necessarily just Rex to potentially exploring some power purchasing agreements or virtual or financial power purchase agreements. So we're going to have this on here just so everybody can have a nice summary. Um, some of the breakdowns, whether it's going to have upfront capital costs, ongoing expenditures, how long the term is for commitment, um, the complexity of the transaction, and then what actually is included in the transaction. So when you look at this, you can see that unbundled RECs, there's really no upfront capital investment. There's a cost premium associated with it for however many RECs you're purchasing. The commitment can actually be something that goes forward, or if people are trying to satisfy years past, it's something that we can help satisfy. It's an easy transaction, and it's really going to only include the RECs. Now, when we go further to the right, we can see um, different the different levels of um, things that might, might change, right? So when we look at financial PPAs or VPPAs, um, you're gonna be looking at different expenditures, cost savings over the life of the contracts. It's either gonna be a cost savings or there's gonna be a cost. The term of the commitment is gonna be varied um, based on the actual asset that they're gonna be getting into. These can range anywhere from seven to 25 years. The complexity of it is going to be dramatically different. Um, there's a lot of contracts. There's a lot of information that has to go through, credit requirements, um, things like that. But again, it includes something else. Like you get the RECs and then you're gonna have the hedge against downside price risk. Um, so there's ways to, depending on what the client really needs to structure these so that they make the most sense and then we can satisfy our client's needs. And again, this is gonna be a handy chart for everybody where um, they're able to figure out like what their organizational goals are. Um, you can see if they have environmental, economic, stakeholder, um, director impact on new supply, and then just some things where they can consider um, what they're doing. So this can look at on-site, off-site, and shared renewables. And this is just going to be a guide to help you kind of figure out what our clients need and to help walk you through this. Now, when you come across some of these opportunities, please make sure you reach out to your Mantis account manager. Um, they're going to be happy to help navigate the complexity of this to make sure that your clients can get satisfied um, and that they can get what they need in order to claim what they have to. Um, you have a full service group in the back here that's willing to help do whatever it needs in order to make sure that our clients get what they need. So in summary, just want to kind of tie it all together. 
right? So we're trying to be more, and we are more than just a fixed price option. We wanna make sure our clients know that we want to help them balance their risk. We want them to help them balance their um, cost. We want them to be in the right program for the right length of time and to make smart decisions, not just necessarily today, but throughout the entire time um, that they're with us. We're also able to help with not only the cost of power, but we can help them manage the capacity costs, how they handle and manage the renewables. We want to make sure that if they if there are some changes coming up, if there is an option to potentially grandfather um, some of the renewables in states so that they don't get hit with additional charges like that happened in Rhode Island. Um, Things like that, we're able to be on top of and make sure that our clients are in the best position available. Um, we can also do this with green energy. We can also help manage um, JM market and then ancillaries. Um, we're able to make sure that they get into the right product that matches their risk profile, the needs and the operation of their whole entire um, organization. So I'm gonna turn this over to John to just kind of talk a little bit, um, give the Reader's Digest version of some hedging strategies that we've seen and how they could be effective. All right, so one of the other things is, you know I mean, are we just buying a percentage of the load for an entire term? So if it's a 12, 24, 36 month, are we just taking 50% and locking that in, locking in 25 now and then do another 25 and 25 until we get up to 100%? Or are we also looking at, you know, I mean, only locking in the outside years because we think maybe the rest of this year might come off until the winter and we start locking in that January of 24? Are we buying, you know, I mean, depending on when the client runs, protecting from the winter, protecting from the summer? You can come up with any strategy. The bigger the client, the more customized and white glove the approach, but we'd be happy to take a look because a plan really changes for each different client. What are their risks? What do they see that's out there after they hear all this news? Um, and what do they think the likely outcome is? Because that's what we can tailor a product to be and to fit to what they need. And then Craig, back to you just to wrap. All right, well, thanks everybody. Um, just a couple key takeaways here to finish this off. Um, so, just remember that there's more than just a fixed and that there's more than just an index. There are ways where we can structure our programs and our commodity solutions that can really impact large companies, small businesses, government entities, and to really show them that they have different options um, in order to make sure that they're doing what they need. Um, what you also see is that you see that clients are gonna lock into a fixed price product if they think the market is gonna go up. Clients will lock into an index price product if they think the market is going to go down. There's different risks associated with that. But we live in an environment right now where we don't exactly know what the market is going to do. Um, the trend line, the volatility that we have seen over the past 18 months has changed how we need to approach risk with our clients. And by looking at different strategies and creating a customized managed solution, we're gonna be giving our clients the best of both worlds while also creating significant amounts of value for them. And then that will be coming from us as the consultant. So it will really help them manage the risk. Um, again, there's gonna be a four different primary ways, different components of a hybrid. You're gonna have a blending of percentage where you're gonna be doing anywhere from zero to 100% fixed, zero to 100% index. We have the ability to layer. So we can layer in different purchases over different periods of time. Um, just like the utilities do. So if people are like, well, I want to buy like the utility or I want to be with the utility. Well, why don't we just go ahead and build you a customized solution that mirrors how the utility hedges? Um, we are able to do that. Um, timing, again, we want to make sure that they're doing it based on the time that they need and to try to take advantage of market conditions to make sure that they're going to be in the best, um, best program possible. And then Program management, do they want to be something, do they want to be active in this program? Do they just want to approve things when it comes up? We just need to figure out how involved that they'd like to be. And the areas where we've really found success in this is it's, we present our clients some information, we give them some options, and then we want to let them know, like, this is a potential opportunity to make a decision.
that can impact you for the next 12, 24, 36, 48, 60 months, whatever it may be. If you need anything, let us know. Um, please feel free to contact your account manager or contact info at mantisinnovation.com. Um, we're happy to help. We want to make sure that you have all the information that you need. Um, and let us know where we can help. We're, we're, we're happy to, and we want to just make sure that our clients and your clients get in the right type of a program, and then hopefully we can lead them down the path of sustainability as well. So thank you, John. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and we will talk again.